Thank you. Thank you, men. We could also have someone close those back doors, too. Thank you. <clears throat> it's hard to obey. In fact, it's not natural to obey. Obedience is very unnatural. We push against obedience from the moment, from the moment we are born. Obedience to parents, to teachers, to laws, to God. Every bit of it, we push against. In fact, we only learn to obey when we come up against something that makes obedience look more attractive than disobedience. The first thing we come up against is often pain. Whether it's a, a smack on the hand or a swat on the bottom or an expensive traffic ticket or life in prison, all of these things make obedience look more attractive than disobedience. The second thing we come up to, to or come up against is guilt. Guilt strikes at our emotions. Guilt achieves obedience by bringing, bringing to mind our failures. Guilt-based obedience is, is like being sent down into a well and then being left from that point to crawl our way out. And we do so, we attempt to climb out because standing at the top of the well looks more attractive than being down at the bottom of the well. Then there was love. Love is the best of the three. Love also, like guilt, strikes at our emotions. But it seeks to achieve obedience from a different perspective, a different starting place. It begins by looking outside and not inside. We, we obey because pleasing another is more attractive than displeasing another. Love-based obedience is, is like climbing a mountain to obtain something. Because standing up there looks, looks uh, more attractive than standing, standing down here. Or maybe, to use our other word picture, constructing some kind of pulley system to, to lower ourselves down in the well so our friend might come to the top. This morning, I want to look at a passage of scripture that, that I hope will make obedience look more attractive than disobedience. A passage that does more than exhort us to obey for fear of injury or shame or even love. But a passage that demands obedience based on one of the chief, the chief attributes of God, the holiness of God. So if you haven't already, please open your Bibles up to the white pages, Numbers chapter 20. If you can find it, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers chapter 20. Israel was delivered from Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea and entered into the wilderness of Sinai. Yahweh deepened and broadened his relationship with Israel through the law. Israel had in, uh, erected a tabernacle, and in Numbers chapter 10, they begin their short journey towards the promised land. The land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Numbers 13 and 14, Israel arrives at Kadesh. It is from this point that the spies, you remember, were sent into the land of promise. They were sent to investigate the quality of the land and its defenses. What happens next is shocking. The spies report that the land flows with milk and honey. But the cities are, they're fortified and they're very large. They report, sinfully as we find out, that this land, this promised land, it will devour any who try to take it. And so Israel sins by not trusting the Lord, trusting that the Lord could bring them into such a land, the land of promise. And so standing at Kadesh, on the threshold of promise, Israel arouses the anger of God, who tells Moses that he's going to actually disinherit his people. He uses that word. I'm going to disinherit them. And Moses, like Moses often does, he appeals to God. He appeals to the chesed, right? The loyal love, the covenant love of Yahweh, who turns from his anger and issues a judgment. That the entire generation of rebellious Israel must 
fall dead in the wilderness before the nation can enter into the promised land. Look down with me at Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Kadesh is that tragic location where the spies were sent into the land of Canaan. But in this passage, in Numbers 20, Israel has returned to that location. In Numbers 20, a generation has fallen, and Israel finds itself again on the threshold of promise. Israel has literally come full circle. And so they are here in Kadesh with another chance. You see, it says there, the first month. That's the, that should be understood as the first month of the 40th year. So you, you could divide numbers up between chapters 1 through 19 and 20 through 36. Israel's first chance and maybe their second chance. The census in chapter 1 and then the, the census in chapter 26. The census of the old generation, the generation that would fall, and then the census of the new generation, the gener generation that actually would walk into the promised land. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Miriam was, you remember, Moses' sister. She was a leader. She was a, a prophetess, a songstress of Israel. Miriam was most likely that young girl who suggested to Pharaoh's daughter that a nurse be called to feed and care for baby Moses. This clues us in a little bit on her courage and her leadership ability. It's significant that the text names her here. In fact, she is the only woman whose death uh, has been remembered from the generation that f fell in the wilderness. N nowhere else are we given a specific name of someone who fell in the wilderness, like we are here of Miriam. Now, you remember there was a time that Miriam, with Aaron, opposed Moses, Numbers chapter 12. As a result of that op uh, opposition, Miriam was struck with lepros leprosy. And we see the great love that Moses had for her when he cries out to Yahweh, Oh God, please heal her. Please heal my sister, God. We also see the, the great love that Israel, the nation of Israel had for Moses, or for Miriam, when in fact they waited to leave. The tabernacle and, and all of Israel as a nation waited to leave until the, the years of purification had passed for her. It would, it would have been no small thing for Israel and Moses to lose Miriam. Israel felt the judgment of Yahweh at Kadesh in no clearer way than to lose Miriam. Everyone had died, and now Miriam was dead. Verse 2. Now, there was no water for the congregation. Kadesh was not only the burial place of Miriam, but it was a barren land with no water. And as we will see, soon see, there was no food there either. It is interesting that the place that is so important to Israel's history, Kadesh, is a place where there is no water and there is no food. This is a place that Israel must lean on Yahweh. They must trust their God from Kadesh. Will Israel trust Yahweh? Well, we learn that they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up again Come up out of Egypt and bring us to this evil place. It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. And there is no water to drink. Israel expresses no trust. Rather, she quarrels. Literally, the word here means to lay a case. They laid a case against Moses. And their arguments are strong. They argued that it would, would have been better to die in the wilderness than to be again at Kadesh. Kadesh was 
designed to be an open window, a, a, a beautiful open window in which Israel would stand and they would look onto the promised land. This is where they would, they would get ready to enter into the promised land. And this place, this location, Kadesh, Kadesh had become a, a, a horrible place to them, a place of judgment, a reminder to them that indeed they would have to wait. I thought of standing at the, the southern edge of the Grand Canyon and looking out and beholding the magnificence. In the same way, Israel would have stood there at Kadesh and thought, here we go. Now we, we take our trek up. But no, in the words of verse 5, this had become to Israel an evil place. I think we're often very critical of Israel. I know I can be. It's easy to be critical. You realize there's not a person standing here who, who hasn't lost their parents and their grandparents. In fact, the only prospect of, of finally getting out of the wilderness comes when someone dies. They have returned to this place that evoked so much anger, so much regret, so much tragedy. And now, here they are, digging Miriam's grave. This woman that they loved, burying her. The last recorded woman, person, of this generation that would fall in the wilderness. And now, <laughs> Moses, there's no water. There's no food. What are we supposed to do? It's not hard for us to enter into that kind of thinking. You know, each one of us has been to Kadesh, so to speak. A place filled with hopelessness, where God's goodness and mercy is swallowed up by our circumstances, where his, his promises are veiled by the present. And it's always from this masked view of God that we, we, we point the finger. That's when we point the finger. That's when we, we lay a case against God. We want an explanation for our problems. And as we wait longer and time moves on and on, right, the tension builds and the, the, the case gets stronger. We, we want an answer. Why don't we have what we want? And I suspect if we feel that way, very few of us have waited 40 years for something. Maybe some of you. But Israel has waited 40 years, and they've seen all of their loved ones fall. Israel's case was laid open before Moses. I apologize for the microphone. Our, our case is usually not so conspicuous. So the complaint against Moses and Aaron had been heard. Next, the defendants approach the bench to hear the divine ruling. Verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of Yahweh appeared to them. The tent of meeting here is not the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the, 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 the place where the Lord dwelled among his people, and it's where they went for public worship. This tent of meeting is, is a different place. It's outside the encampment. It's where Israel's leaders would go, and they would seek the divine will. They would seek the will of the Lord. Moses and Aaron's posture expresses fear and reverence. They put their faces to the ground. And Yahweh responds by appearing to them, right? The glory of the Lord appeared to them. What do you think Moses would have expected Yahweh to say to rebellious Israel here? What would you expect Yahweh to say to Israel? Might I suggest that what, what we expect Yahweh to say here to rebellious, obstinate Israel 
might say something about what we think about God and who Yahweh is. Maybe you're thinking something like this. 38 years ago, Israel stood at the threshold of the promised land. And they failed to trust their God, the God who delivered them from Egypt. They were forced to walk for nearly 40 years in the wilderness and had returned to the very location that they failed to trust him. Nothing has changed. They're still rebellious Israel. They are so rebellious and so ungrateful. They actually said that it would have been better if they fell in the wilderness than to live another day and stand here again at Kadesh. They would rather be in the grave with Miriam than standing outside and giving her a eulogy. No more chances. That's enough. Israel needs another one of these experiences where the ground opens up and they fall into it. They need a, another round of pestilence or, or famine. You know, in fact, maybe another generation should fall. Maybe you're thinking something like this. If Yahweh were to demand another generation fall in the wilderness, what do you think that next generation would do standing here? Do you think they somehow would have figured it out? Israel's repeated rebellion proves that their entry into the promised land is only possible by the grace and kindness of Yahweh. Israel would have been shackled in Egypt. They would have been trapped at the foot of Mount Sinai. They would have been left to perpetually walk in the wilderness of Paran had it been, had it not been for the chesed of Yahweh, the loyal love of Yahweh. Indeed, it will be the only thing, the only factor that will deliver them from where they are and get them to the promised land. So the Lord speaks to Moses. Here's the divine will. Verse 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff. And assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock from them and give them drink, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Take, assemble, and tell. The staff that had been previously employed in the performance of God's miracles, Moses was to take. You remember the one that he threw down before Pharaoh? The one that turned the Nile into blood? That same staff that was used 38 years earlier in Exodus 14, 16 to strike the rock and water would come out? He was to assemble the congregation. He was to bring the people before the rock. Gather the people together to share in this miraculous provision. Finally, he was to tell the rock to yield water. Moses was told to speak to the rock. We don't know what this would have looked like, but he was told, tell the rock, yield water. Notice Yahweh doesn't rebuke them, he doesn't give them a correction. We're given no insight into how Yahweh felt here. All we have is these simple commands. Take, assemble, tell. And Moses is told that in the performance of these commands, enough water will come out of the rock for the congregation and their cattle to drink. And so as Moses walks away from the bench... The drama is building. Israel is peering through the window of Kadesh onto the promised land. Their their minds are filled with bitter memories. Each person has suffered the loss of their parents. They have lost Miriam, and the camp is filled with the, the cries of thirsty children and the lowing of needy cattle. 
Israel is at a breaking point, and a complaint has been laid against Moses. Yet, these people have a God who knows exactly what they need, a God who, who could deal out the perfect verdict, the perfect judgment, a God who could meet them right where they were. And Moses, as the great mediator of God's people, has received the will of God. Take, assemble, tell. Moses was chosen by God to lead the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. He was named by Pharaoh's daughter, and his name means to draw out, or one who draws. His name alludes to his involvement in the drawing out of Israel from Egypt. And I believe Moses is the most important figure in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And furthermore, maybe the most important figure in all of the Old Testament. I think this is true for two reasons. First, Moses represented Yahweh toward Israel. He represented Yahweh toward Israel. If anyone stood against Yahweh, they would have to answer to Moses. Yahweh told Moses in Exodus 7-1 that he was made like God to Pharaoh. He was made like God to Pharaoh. If there were new revelations from God, if there were signs to be performed, performed, laws to be given, decisions to be made, judgments to be inflicted, Moses was the mediating channel. Someone said the task of Moses was the most appalling commission ever given to a mere man. Appalling because Moses was a man. No one qualifies to represent Yahweh in this way. And Moses not only represented Yahweh to Israel, but Moses represented Israel to Yahweh. As a mediator, he does this. Time and time again, we see Moses pleading for Israel before Yahweh. In our text, we see Moses representing Israel to God as he goes to the tent of meeting to hear the will of God. Moses was given a great amount of authority in these roles, and with such authority comes great responsibility. Moses must always recall the source of his authority. He must remember not to rule in his own right, to understand rightly that he is an agent for the Lord. And he must remember these instructions. Take, assemble, tell. Verse 9. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. Moses does what we would expect him to do. He obeys. He took the staff and he assembled the people. Two out of the three. The, 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 the language here stresses the obedience of Moses. The, the, this little phrase, as he commanded him, is used time and time again, especially in Exodus and Numbers. And it always, it always is there to, to say, this is a person who obeys this is a person who follows the command of Yahweh. This is a faithful person. And so, with his staff in hand, with the staff in hand, and with all of the, the, the people assembled, Moses turns to the rock. No. Moses doesn't turn to the rock. Moses turns to the people. And he says, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? I don't think there's a more human response than this, than what Moses does here. All the years of rebellion and complaint, the bitterness towards those he was called to care for, all the years of intercession and nothing in return. A people so obstinate, so rebellious, so ungrateful. 
I, I think of Moses here as like a balloon that's just pressed to the very edge and just the second before it blows, that's Moses. And he's, he's blowing up here. He's lost it. He just could not take the pressure for another second. Listen now, you rebels. Moses took the Lord's instruction and and used it as a means to justify his self-interest and self-pity. These words are not spoken by a man who understands that he's an agent of the Lord. These these words are spoken by by a man who has stepped outside of his calling. These words are not the words of Yahweh. They're not divine words. These are the words of Moses. These are very human words. And don't miss how Moses pulls Yahweh into his plan. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Moses is no longer the mediator of God's will. Moses has turned God into a mediator of his will. Moses is saying, not your will, Lord, my will be done. These words are, they're not God-glorifying words. These are Moses-glorifying words. Take, assemble, tell. And Moses' rebellion does not stop with his rebuke of Israel. And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. Moses is standing face to face with God's will, the rock. The rock represents the mercy and benevolence of God, a picture of the miraculous, God's provision for his people, a a substance firm and solid, One that might serve as a foundation, a foundation one might build their life, everything around. And Moses stares the rock down and he strikes it. He strikes at the mercy and benevolence of God. And he doesn't strike it once, he strikes it twice. Moses might have been physically striking a rock but he was metaphorically striking at God. God, your way is not the best way. You want to overlook their sin. You want to extend your grace and your mercy on Israel. But I say to you, it's time for judgment. Yet we read at the end of verse 11, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestocks their livestock. Moses' failure, his will, could not thwart the will of God. The Lord demonstrated his kindness, mercy, and patience in spite of Moses' failure. Exodus 33, 11 tells us that Moses spoke face to face with Yahweh. He spoke with Yahweh as a man speaks to his friend. Yahweh says in Numbers 12, 8, with him, that is Moses, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And listen to this, he beholds the form of Yahweh. This kind of relationship had an amazing effect on Moses. We read in Numbers 12 also that Moses was humble more than all people who were on the face of the earth. He was the humblest man that ever lived. Moses had the closest relationship with God that anyone ever had, ever. No one sat with Yahweh and spoke face to face as to a friend. No one was as humble as Moses Take, assemble, tell. So in verse 12, we have the judgment, the verdict issued against Moses. Moses. 
And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. This is the judgment against Moses for his unfaithfulness. The judgment was that Moses and Aaron would not be allowed to bring the assembly into the promised land. The first time Israel camped at Kadesh, a whole generation lost a privilege of entering into the land. And the second time now at Kadesh, Moses and Aaron had lost the privilege of entering the promised land. Moses charged Israel as being the Hamorim, the, the, those ones who are obstinate, literally, the rebellious ones. But who was the Hamorim? Moses was. Moses was the rebel. He was the one that disobeyed the clear instruction from Yahweh. Take, assemble, tell. Maybe this verdict against Moses seems harsh. I think we need to consider a couple things. First, consider where this event took place. Moses was commanded to assemble the congregation before the rock. And the word used here in verse 10 for assembly is, is, a, is a word that's used always to represent a sacred gathering. This was a gathering where Israel expected to hear directly from Yahweh. It was sacred. Yet Moses' words, Moses' actions are not sacred. Israel did not hear from Yahweh. They, in fact, heard from Moses. Consider also that the, res the responsibility that Moses had to represent Yahweh, like we spoke of earlier, to Israel. Moses misrepresented Yahweh. When Moses sought the will of the Lord in verse 6, Yahweh took out his canvas and he painted a picture of mercy and benevolence and patience and long-suffering. That's what he painted. Take the staff, he says. Seeing the staff would only bring to mind for Moses and for the people God's power to do the miraculous. In fact, years ago, he had used that very staff to, to give the people water. Might he do that again? He was commanded to assemble the people. No one was excluded. All of Israel was, was to be there before him to, to, to put on display, to hang this picture. And finally, tell the rock. With a simple word, all of Israel would see God's provision. Mothers would calm their children with bowls, cups, and jars filled with pure water. Men would see their strength return. Water would be in such abundance that cattle and animals would lick up all they needed. The, ch the scene would be changed from a barren wasteland to one of those mall splash pads. Water would be everywhere. And the effect? Not only physical strength, but spiritual strength. The hope that Yahweh will give them the vigor to make it to the promised land finally. But Moses left that meeting, he took that painting under his arm, he stormed out, and he went and he got his own brushes. And he painted over that picture. He, he morphed the lines and painted something else, something careless, something inaccurate. He turned a Rembrandt into that experimental pastel landscape painting that you see at the thrift stores. He defiled a great. He marred a master. Consider where this event took place, the responsibility that Moses had, and finally, the nature of Moses' sin. Moses was guilty of unbelief and blasphemy. Literally, he failed to say amen to Yahweh's instruction at the tent of meeting. The verb describes a, a kind of faith that leads to action. And Moses' action proves that he didn't believe Yahweh. He failed to do what he told him. 
Moses took an aggressive stance towards the people, and he hit the rock twice. Moses proved that he was not satisfied with what God said, but he made it much more forceful and terrifying. And so as a result, Moses gave the people the wrong picture of God. And in so doing, he failed, it says, to keep him holy, to treat him as holy. The basic idea of holiness is to be distinct, to be set apart, to be separate. Moses failed to communicate the distinct, different, and holy nature of Yahweh. Moses gave the people the impression that Yahweh was capricious, he, he could change, he was hostile, he was unpredictable. Moses gave Israel a very common picture of God, a very human picture. Verse 13 says, these are the waters of Meribah, where the, people, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Our story ends with a play on words. The events took place at Kadesh. And verse 13 says that through these events, God showed himself holy. Well, guess what the, the word Kadesh is? Holy. Kadosh. The noun and the verb form are cognates. They're, they're related. At Kadesh, Yahweh would show himself Kadesh. And I believe this is getting at the key concept, the key word of our text this morning. The key idea is holiness. God is on a mission to make much of himself. This mission began at creation and will end in the eternal state. And what we have here is one dot, one dot on that timeline of God's mission. God wants the reader to understand that he is not common. God is not a man that he should be a disobeyed in such a way. And so the result of God's holiness is man's obedience. The result of God's holiness is everything being folded up into his will, his plan. Everything he desires, everything he aims to achieve, every project he begins, every tax, task he undertakes, every journey he sets out on will be accomplished or achieved to the end to which he desires. Because it's very much uncommon. His holiness demands it. God had a plan to meet the needs of Israel. He was going to give them water from the rock. God also desired to use a man to accomplish that desire. Moses would accomplish the will of God. Moses would prove that God is holy by submitting to his desire and trusting the outcome. But instead of being an agent of God's desire, Moses tries to take a detour. But... Thankfully, because the will of God is not subject to the will of man, water comes from the rock. Moses could not thwart the will of God, but lest Israel believe that Moses's, Moses' hostility was from the Lord, Moses suffers judgment. And in this way, Yahweh shows himself holy. Through the ages, Israel would remember this failure. It's even spoken of at the end of the Pentateuch in Deuteronomy chapter 32. One of the last things that's mentioned is this. Moses and Aaron were not permitted to enter the promised land because of the waters of Meribah. Moses would walk the rest of his life with a mark on his back, pressing forward, but always knowing that his feet would never enter the promised land. And Moses' failure would serve to remind Israel that there is a connection between obedience and and holiness. God's holiness demanded Moses' obedience. And God's holiness demands our obedience. And I don't have to tell you this. We understand 
we understand that believing the gospel, as a result of the gospel, we obey. From the moment of our conversion, we aim to please him. 1 John chapter 2 is helpful here. Chapter 2, verses 3 and 6, 3 through 6. By this we know that we have come to know him, to believe in him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he, that is Jesus, walked. We are to obey. But what you might not have considered is what your disobedience communicates. If the holiness of God demands our obedience, then our disobedience denigrates it. It denigrates the holiness of God. Our obedience lifts up God's holiness And our disobedience attempts to suppress God's holiness. Like a beach ball trying to push it under the water. We're trying to suppress God's holiness when we disobey. Our disobedience tells God and tells the world that God is common. He's not distinct. He's not set apart. He's not completely different that we should obey him. We are saying that our common, earthly, ordinary plan is actually the better one. If you're here this morning and you haven't believed in the gospel, the holiness of God demands your obedience. And the gospel, friends, is a command to be obeyed. It is a command. I think Hebrews 5, 9 is is helpful. It says Jesus became the source of eternal salvation, the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He's the source of our salvation because we obeyed him. Because the gospel came at us as a command, repent and believe. And so we obey. Don't walk out of this room trusting in something common. Walk out of this room trusting in something very uncommon. Trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Friends, I hope the holiness of God makes obedience look more attractive than disobedience. I don't think it's always bad. It's necessarily bad to obey for fear of punishment or for shame or for love. But but these are common motivators. There is one motivator that is very uncommon, and that is the holiness of God. Arthur Pink said, the more our hearts are awed by his ineffable, that is his amazing or indescribable holiness, the more acceptable will our approaches be unto him. I believe Pink is getting at our point with this quote. Moses was not amazed by the holiness of God when he left the tent of meeting. And the result was that his approaches, his approach to God was not acceptable. The more our hearts are awed by his ineffable holiness, the more acceptable will be our approaches unto him. Would you pray with me? I'm going to use a prayer from the Valley of Vision to guide our prayers. O Lord God, who inhabits eternity, the heavens declare your glory, the earth your riches, the universe is your temple, your presence fills immensity, yet you have of your pleasure created life and communicated happiness. You have made us what we are and given us what we have. In you, we live and move and have our being. 
Your providence has set the bounds of our habitation and wisely administers, admi administers all of our affairs. Lord, we thank you for your riches to us in Jesus, for the unclouded revelation of him in your word, where we behold his person, his character, his grace, his glory, his humiliation, his sufferings, his death and resurrection. Give us to feel a need of his continual saviorhood and cry with Job, I am vile. With Peter, I perish. With the publican, be merciful to me, a sinner. Subdue in me, in us, Lord, the love of sin. Let us know the need of renovation as well, of, as, well as forgiveness in order to serve and enjoy you forever. We come to you in the all-prevailing name of Jesus with nothing of our own to plead. No works, no worthiness, no promises. We are often straying, often knowingly opposing your authority, often abusing your goodness. But help us to not be careless of your favor or regardless of your glory. Impress in us or impress us deeply with a sense of your holiness that you are about my path, my ways, our ways, our laying down, and our end. That our hearts would be awed by your ineffable holiness so that our approaches to you would be acceptable. In the holy name of Jesus we pray, amen.